Good morning, Calvary. So good to see all of you today. Thankful that you are here. We're going to begin our service today with a song of celebration. If you would, please stand up as we worship together. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. true for all of us amen thank you for coming today uh, we're especially glad if you're a guest of Calvary Baptist Church thank you for picking Calvary to be your place of worship this morning if you are a guest 
and you've never done this before, there uh, should be in front of you a guest card. I think they're yellow. Maybe there's several cards, actually, that you could make a response on if you have a prayer request or different things there. But if you're a guest, a first-time guest, and have never filled one of those out, please fill that out and uh, make it your gift and the offering when it's passed here in a little bit. And we would appreciate that. And also, if you're a first-time guest, uh, we have some Calvary. I don't know what you call them. What do you call those? They're not mugs. They're not koozies. Tumbler. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Little metal tumblers that we, we'd like to just give you a gift to say thank you for being here this morning. Uh, let's bow in prayer. Father God, we love you. We appreciate, God, the opportunity we have to serve you corporately like this. Um, unhindered. Thank you so much, God. And Lord Jesus, we just pray this morning that you would be honored and blessed. We realize that we have an audience of one that we're trying to please. Father, if there's even one individual, one person that doesn't know Jesus as Savior, may they hear through the preaching of your word, the singing of worship songs, may they be compelled to come to know you today. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing as we continue to worship.
I've tasted and seen. Have you done that? I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence
deeper. He knows our hearts this morning. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm so feels like it's a little warm in here, maybe because we're all wearing coats and sweaters and so forth, but hopefully it won't get too warm if it does. If you start fanning, if we see a number of people fanning, we'll kick the air on a little more if we need to. In other words, we'll move forward. Glad you're here this morning. I'm impressed with the crowd. Good turnout. There's more of you than I anticipated. I mean more numerically. I know we all ate a lot of food. There may be more of us than we want to have of us as well. So I've always made a promise I would never preach on gluttony the day after a holiday. So unfair to the church, wouldn't it? So unfair. But I do want to encourage you to pray. We have a number of family members going through some challenging days. Merlene Benedict, continue to lift her up and her help. Uh, John and Regina. Johnson have a grandchild who was in the hospital the last couple of days, and um, they're headed back to Austin now, and uh, certainly need some healing brought into her life. Uh, my mom has been in the hospital the last two days uh, with, uh, what is it when your heart gets out of, your father's had this, Carrie? That's it. Um, they did that shock thing, and of course, I didn't know they shocked you while you're conscious and like awake <laughs> and aware of it. Um, I thought they'd put her to sleep, and they didn't, so that kind of scared her a little bit. What to me? Um, Suzanne's home with a migraine. I have a number of people who have been going through quite a number of illnesses over the last many weeks and so forth. This time of year, the weather going up and down as far as temperatures, and rainy one day, dry another, and so forth. So just a lot going on. But it's great to have the holidays and opportunity to be together as family. It reminded me of a time that a wife took her husband to the hospital because he had been ill for quite some time. And after an examination, the doctor came to his wife and 
pulled her to the side and whispered to her, says, I don't like the way your husband looks. And she says, I know, but he's been a good father all these years. <laughs> well, we, we have been looking at what family looks like uh, the last couple of weeks, and we will continue today in that. We are wanting to remind ourselves what Scripture says about family, marriage, parenting. Because we live in a world today that is constantly trying to rewrite, redefine marriage, redefine family, the purposes of as well. We live in a culture today that is antagonistic to God's ways. And if we're not careful, that'll creep into the life of the church. And so we periodically need to look back into the Word of God and make sure we're very clear and what God is, is saying to us, and therefore stand strong and live according to his word in the days to come. I began the series by showing you a proper foundation for family in Psalms 127, verse 1, that says, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. To, to leave God out of our marriages and out of our families is disastrous. To attempt to establish and build a family on our own and our own powers and abilities would be futile. So I encourage you to, to not leave God out, but instead to, to pursue God and to allow him to be the architect of your family. Make him the highest priority in your family. So far in this series, we have seen that Scripture shows us that God initiated family families God initiated we saw that back in creation where God brought man and woman together it was his design for man and woman to come into a relationship that we call marriage today family is also goal specific that goal being oneness Fellowship and a relationship with God, but a oneness to be experienced with one another. Family unity, in other words. And then also, we, family is grace reflected. It is a beautiful picture. When it's lived, according to the principles of the Bible, it is a beautiful reflection of the grace that God has offered to us. As we remember that Adam and Eve once lived in a very perfect environment, they had a perfect relationship with one another. All of it was good. But they disobeyed God, sin entered into the world, and everything changed as a result of that. But in his graciousness, God came to Adam and Eve, and he gave a beautiful picture of that of which we see through the life, the death, and ultimately the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where he comes along and graciously offers us a second beginning. New chances in life. And family has an opportunity to reflect such grace as well. So family is God-initiated, goal-specific, and grace-reflected. And we also saw last week from Ephesians chapter 5 that marriage was designed to present something beyond itself. An image of Christ's relationship with the people of God, the church. Marriage exist was designed to present something beyond itself. In other words, we don't get married and put a period on it. There's a purpose beyond ourselves. There's, a, there's an eternal perspective here that we want to keep in mind. See, in biblical marriage, the watching world has an opportunity to see the gospel displayed when a husband lovingly sacrifices his life for his wife and his family. And a wife willingly yields her life to his leadership. They see God's love for this world, Christ and his sacrifice for the church, and a church willingly submitting herself to Christ as being the head of the church. And I shared with you last week that the ultimate purpose of marriage is to glorify God. The ultimate purpose of marriage is to glorify God. It never was about us. It always has been and always will be about God. So today, I want to 
continue on, as we looked at last week, the ultimate purpose of marriage. I want to continue on with more a purpose of marriage. But I realized this week that I can show these purposes, how they actually point back to bringing glory to God. And so I want to share with you, first of all this morning, that marriage glorifies God when marriage is seen through God's eternal perspective. Marriage glorifies God when marriage is seen through God's eternal perspective. Going back to Ephesians chapter 5, we see, Scripture says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. When you look back to the Old Testament, marriage and family certainly is a great mystery. But the New Testament, Christ comes along and helps clears up the picture. He clearly shares with us why marriage exists and the ultimate purpose for which it was initiated. We know Back in Genesis chapter 1, that God created. He created the heavens. He created the earth. God created light. God created the sky. God created the land, seas, plants, trees. God created stars, sun, moon. God created animals for the sea and the land and the air. Then in the crowning moment of creation, God created man and woman. But there's a problem. As we perceive creation, as we even read through the creation story, and as we begin to perceive ourselves as being the crowning moment, as we begin to reflect on the special relationship that we have with God that all the rest of creation does not enjoy, sometimes we begin to think too highly about ourselves. And that can be very dangerous. I submit to you that when you look at our universe, the largeness of our universe, it reflects how big our God is. And that alone ought to cause us to be humble. Listen, if the entire universe was this earth that we live on, then it would be very easy for us to believe that this universe was created for us. But when we go past this earth and realize that there are literally 10,000s of galaxies out there that are constantly being discovered, that this universe goes way beyond, that our earth is just merely a speck in all of creation, and therefore we are merely just specks upon a speck. We, we suddenly realize, you know what? We don't have to think too highly of ourselves after all. Instead, we can think highly of our God. Because he's created all of this. In his infinite creative way, everything exists here today for God. The psalmist writes in 19, 19, excuse me, Psalms 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. We didn't build this. We couldn't have. God is unimaginably greater. Infinitely more valuable. And unsurpassed in beauty. And everything that was created is meant to reflect those truths about God. Everything exists for God, including man. We exist for the glory of God. After the exile of God's people, the Lord told his people through his prophet Isaiah... In Isaiah 43, he says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I created for my glory, whom God created for his glory. Colossians 1.16 in the New Testament says, For by him all things were created. All things were created by him and 
for him. So scripture is very clear about this. We exist for God's glory. He does not exist for ours. So when God established the family, he was desiring to have family be a reflection upon who he is. Family does not exist for our benefit. Though there are many benefits that we have as being a part of a family, we don't need to deny those, but that is not the purpose. Family exists for God's purposes. And when we see marriage in light of God's eternal perspective, then we tend to keep these things in proper perspective. Marriage was not initiated to fulfill our desires, but to fulfill God's eternal plan. Marriage was not initiated for our pleasure, but for God's satisfaction. Marriage was not created for our happiness, but for God's glory. His eternal perspective must be kept in mind. Second of all, marriage glorifies God when marriage roles are accepted as prescribed by God. Marriage glorifies God when marriage roles are accepted and prescribed by God. God. Now we're going to look at this even more closely next week as, as I will share with you from Scripture why so much of our country here in America is getting this wrong today and the attempts to change laws and to change and redefine marriage even though some are actually using Scripture to make their points. I will share, share with you how they're taking Scripture and they're twisting it, showing that they're using it wrong. But if we, if we get this wrong, our roles wrong, then marriage does not glorify God. God has given specific roles to the husband and to the wife. Colossians 3, 18, 19, we, we talked about this last week a little bit, so I, I won't go in great detail this morning about it. But it says, wives, submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. With them. The important thing in these verses is a phrase, as is fitting in the Lord. In other words, this is how God designed it from the very beginning. Some translations say this is what the Lord has planned for you. Again, the, the creator of all of which we see existing today, in his infinite creative way, designed it all with purpose, including man and including marriage, and he gave it a specific purpose and design as well. And in that, and in within marriage, he gave husband and he gave wife, and he gave them specific roles. That is how he planned it. And as I share with you on week one, since we didn't create this world, since we didn't create marriage and or initiate it, we in fact we never would have fought it up, we have no right to change what God has created and initiated. The marriage roles will only be defined as long as both husband and wife daily submit themselves to the Lord. It doesn't happen just because we stood at an altar on one particular day, at one particular moment, and we exchanged words, vows with one another, we said, I do to one another, and we made a commitment. There was a lot of hoopla, a lot of money was spent. We had a wonderful tasting cake and a great reception, followed by a, hopefully a wonderful honeymoon. It doesn't make all of these roles just suddenly fall into place. There has to be a daily Submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ, both by the husband and by the wife. And church, each husband and wife must place a greater importance on their personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ than actually in their marriage relationship. That's hard for us sometimes because... When things aren't going well, we're thinking, I've got to fix this. There's something about me I've got to change. There's something about him or her I've got to change. And, 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 and we want to focus on that. 
and it's natural that we would. But the truth of the matter is, if each of us, husbands and wives, if we would focus more on our relationship with God, He will work out the marriage relationship for us. John Piper says it this way. He says, the power and impulse to carry through the self-denial and daily, monthly, yearly dying that will be required in loving an imperfect wife and loving an imperfect husband must come from a hope-giving, soul-sustaining, superior satisfaction in God. I don't think that our love for our wives or theirs for us will glorify God until it flows from a heart that delights in God more than marriage. So from the very beginning, church, marriage was designed to present something beyond itself, the image of Christ's relationship with the people of God, the church. And as we fulfill our God-given roles, He is glorified. And not only that, the billions of people who live in this world today who do not know God have an opportunity to see the gospel reflected in our relationships. Keep in mind, it's not about us. It's for his glory and for the sake of reaching nations for his kingdom. Third, marriage glorifies God when marriage fulfills God's mandate to procreate. You cannot get around this. This is scripture. It's very clear to us that marriage fulfills God's mandate to procreate. Genesis chapter 1. On the third day of creation, God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that will bear fruit with seed in it according to the various kinds. So God created the plants and the animals in such a way as to where they would reproduce themselves. On the fifth day... Of creation in Genesis chapter 1, after he created the animals for the sea and the air, God said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. On the sixth day of creation, after God had made Adam and Eve, he blessed them. And in Genesis 1 28, he said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And even after the second beginning, and Genesis chapter 9, after the the great flood in which humanity was wiped out, Noah and just his family survived that flood, God gave Noah and his sons the mandate, again, to be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So this is very clear to us that as part of creation, God designed plants, animals, and people to be able to reproduce themselves. Plants make more plants. Animals make more animals, and people make more people. This is the way it's been designed. Plants don't make animals. Animals don't make people. And people don't make plants or animals. This has been his design from the beginning. People give birth to people. And so God designed marriage, the family, husband and wife, man and woman to come together, given the mandate to procreate, to multiply and increase in number. So one of the most basic principles of marriage is that to produce more people who reflect his image. Long before government, long before school, God established, initiated family. And we see no indication of all of Scripture of him rescinding that mandate to be fruitful and increase in number. I guess you could say that when it comes to God, the more the merrier applies to his desire. He simply wants to build a family of worshipers a worldwide size family of worshipers who would ultimately reflect his image and bring glory to him. And it is through the family that he desires to do that. And we live in a world today 
where science is, is beginning to attempt to manipulate that in some very dangerous ways. And man will, f- will be able to find ways to manipulate. But I submit to you today, church, that man will never find the ability to be able to create. That is a power that exists with God and God alone. To me, God's mandate to be fruitful and increase in number is an obvious one. And there's really no need to dispute it. And I believe it also puts to rest, really, what we're going to talk about next week. The fact that a marriage is between one husband and one wife. For each of these purposes that we have already looked at cannot, in fact, be fulfilled outside of a biblical marriage. But having said all that, what I realized this week, as I reflected on what this message was bringing out, is that we do live in a fallen world. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They sinned. Sin entered into the world. And everything about their relationship with God and with one another changed significantly, including procreation. And so I started thinking of a number of you who have gone through some very painful experiences in life in this particular area. And I found that studies are showing that as many as one in six couples in America experience infertility. According to one study, national estimates are roughly 15 to 20 percent of all pregnancies in the United States end in miscarriage. Even after birth, the loss of a child is a painful reality that far too many families have had to experience. So we live in a fallen world. These are realities. And there are a number of families in this church and even more so in our community who have walked through some very painful experiences in life. The emotional pain, the feelings of hopelessness sometimes can appear to be overwhelming and unbearable. Resentment, anger, bitterness, discouragement, even jealousy towards others are normal experiences, emotions experienced in such occasions. And there's no easy answers. We, the church, and friends, family who have not walked through such journeys, we mean well when we sometimes try to provide answers. We try to say same things like, it's for the better. Maybe it's just God's timing. And none of those help in the moment. We just don't know what to say. But we know these are incredibly difficult and painful moments. And then when you hear and you read through Scripture and you're going through a series like this and you're reminded that one of the purposes of marriage is to procreate, is to build a family. And, and, but then things like this happen in life. You're like, why? And you might as well just take that to the same question that's been asked for generations after generations after generations. Why does evil exist? Why does any bad thing happen? And it goes all the way back to sin coming into the world. And so for a family whose granddaughter was in the hospital just two days ago. And they have cried out for God to heal. And to this point, God has not. Their pain still remains. To a church member whose mother is going through a very difficult time right now. And 
And there certainly was not a shortage of prayers on her behalf. These are realities that are faced every day. What does it mean? How do we respond? One, one encouragement I have for us as followers of Lord Jesus Christ, when we discover the pain in such realities is to develop a deep hatred for sin. Because that's why they exist. Such a hatred that we refuse to participate with sin. We would do what the Bible says, to flee and to run from it, to avoid it. And I'm not suggesting by any means as a family walks through such journeys that is the result of their personal sin. It may be a consequence of some choice made earlier in life, but oftentimes it's simply because we live in this fallen world. It's not your personal sin, it's sin in general. And that's what I'm talking about, I just hate sin. Hate it so much that though we can't change our circumstances and the family, what the family's going through today, but we can avoid being a part of sin and giving giving credibility to sin in other areas of our lives instead of joining in with so much of what our world is doing. My encouragement is this. Marriage glorifies God when a husband and wife faithfully trust in the Lord and depend upon his grace in painful times. Marriage glorifies God when a husband and wife faithfully trust in the Lord and depend upon his grace in painful times. I want to close out with this. I encourage you to know that you're not alone. That's why I wanted to share the results of those surveys and studies. There are, are many people who have walked through a journey that you perhaps have walked through yourself or maybe going through this day. You're not alone. There are many within this church body that have had experiences similar to yours as well. But you're not alone. God is with you. You have a family with you as well, a God-given family, and you have a church family also to love on you and to pray for you and to support you and encourage you in any way that we can. Second of all, I encourage you by, help, by reminding you that all things are possible with God. In just the area of infertility, I was reminded that, that it's in the Bible, Abraham and Sarah, Jacob and Rachel, Elkanah and Hannah, Zechariah and Elizabeth, all of them experienced a period of infertility. And eventually God did, in fact, bless each of these particular uh, marriages with children. In each of these cases, by the way, uh, perhaps the reason why they're mentioned in Scripture is they became a great man of God. Isaac, Joseph, Samuel, and John the Baptist. Don't forget, all things are possible with God. And lastly, believe this, that God is good all the time. Not just in the good days, but also in the difficult days. Not just when you feel like you're being blessed and everything's going your way, but when you feel like you're being attacked and it feels like nothing's going your way. Not just when it feels like the sun is just shining on your life, but also when the storms are pounding in your life. God is good all the time. This morning, I... I just want us to pray. And we'll have an invitation as well. But before we get to the invitation, I want us to pray. Believing that in this room there are a number of hearts that are deeply hurting. Because of a past painful experience or because of a present one. And for some in this room, it's a very private one. Because you've shared it with no one or if any, maybe just one or two. And I'm not going to ask you to share that uh, publicly. We just want to pray for you. So I want to ask everyone, would you join me as we pray? Father, I come before you this morning and asking, knowing how gracious and loving you are and how much you deeply care for us, that you would, in your infinite and powerfully miraculous way, 
touch the hearts of those in this room who are hurting this day. The circumstances are or have been overwhelming. And just like in my own life, when things have become difficult, sometimes I stand strong and other times I don't. So I ask, Father, on their behalf, for those who right now feel so overwhelmed, they feel as if something's wrong with them, I just pray, Father, that you assure them that you're with them and you love them. I pray, Father, that in the midst of their difficult days, that you help them to begin to see your presence and your power in their lives. And I do pray, Father, you would use their life in such a way as to bring glory to yourself. To allow their pain to be helpful to those who go through similar painful moments. And healing can be experienced. Hope can be restored. That you would surround these hearts with family and friends who genuinely care and love one another. Maybe this would be a good reminder for all of us to realize the importance of having healthy families because we, we never know when such an experience enters into our lives and we will need one another. And we need to be at a point where we can talk openly and honestly and lovingly to one another. I pray for healthy families in this church, in this community as well. Father, I do pray also believe in that in this community there are a number of people whose lives have been greatly disrupted disrupted by difficulties in life. There has been a grief that has come into their life because of a loss of a loved one. There's been pain because of relationship challenges and failures. And Father, we stand here as a church family as a beacon of hope to this community. And I pray that you would use this church and all of her resources in such a way as to bring hope into the lives of those whose hearts are hurting and help them to see you for who you are. A loving, gracious, merciful God. That they one day would become a part of your eternal family as well. We pray all this to happen again for your glory, for your purposes, for no other. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning as we sing this song of invitation, I invite you, if you're here this morning, that have something in your heart God's been talking to you about and it. He wants you to share that with this church publicly. We invite you to come forward. I'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you and pray about that possibility. If you're looking for um, a life group to join or if you would like to join this church, we invite you during this time. Also, if you want to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we would love the opportunity to talk with you as well. Staff and Bible study leaders are here to pray with you also. If you would like to meet with somebody for a few moments and pray personally with somebody, you come forward. We would... Uh, we would cherish the opportunity to pray with you. You stand as we sing, you respond. Just as I am without one plea, but that
time as we prepare to receive our offering this morning. Father, I do ask a blessing upon this offering, and I thank you for the generosity of so many in this church. And I thank you personally, Father, because of an awareness that these funds oftentimes are used to minister to the hurting hearts of many within this church, in this community, and even in other parts of the world. As you, in your incredibly infinite way, bring certain ministries and sometimes certain individuals along beside somebody walking through a difficult journey. And you sometimes resource those efforts through offerings such as this. And I thank you for that. And I pray, Father, this offering would be blessed by your presence and your power, and used mightily to bring in many into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. The Great Commission is a command from Jesus to all of us to go and make disciples of all nations, which means all of us, through our praying, our giving, our going, together we all have a part to play in seeing the gospel spread to the ends of the earth. Well within that first year of planting our church, before we were really ready uh, to do an overseas trip, we knew we wanted to go. When a particular team goes, I mean, the whole church feels like we're all going. We're going with them. This is what we do as sent ones. It's just a privilege to be able to be sent. I think about all of the people who've invested in us. We stand on the shoulders of thousands and thousands and thousands of people who've gone before us. the privilege of really shepherding my children's hearts. We want them to not only hear about missions, we want them to understand it the way God wants us to. You share with those around you, you share with those in America, and then you share around the world. We get up at six and we pray for the missionaries. I don't think there's anything quite as powerful to me as someone coming up to me and say, I prayed for you, or I'm praying for you. And you see all the hurt in the world, you see the needs, you see what you have, and you're able to help other people. We wanna give, even though we're small, even when we don't want to, even when we feel like it's hard, 
Um, we want to show the love of Christ and lavishly give grace and, and things that we can give as he's given to us. It's not, you know, all about what I can get out of it. Um, it's about God's love for me and how that changes my heart to share that with everyone else that I meet. And so it's, it's kind of changed the way that I do my business. So I see these two groups at work. You've got a group of churches who are praying and giving and sending out missionaries and a group of missionaries then who are spreading the gospel in some of the hardest, most difficult, dangerous to reach places and peoples in the world. And together, there's a unity there that is resounding to the glory of God. In partnership with you, the IMB sends and supports missionaries all over the world. And the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is a critical part of that support. 100% of gifts that you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering go directly to missionaries who are spreading the gospel among the nations. We encourage you to prayerfully consider how you might contribute to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Special envelopes are in the chair backs in front of you to use uh, should you choose to participate. We hope you will. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, come next Sunday um, and pray about next Sunday. Uh, I, I want to sh present to you, and I'm trying to get it all in one sermon right now. That's the hard part, um, condensing it. Um, six passages of scripture uh, that show God's design for marriage and, and I believe uh, deflate any argument that exists out in the world today, uh, contrary to, to God's biblical design. Uh, on December the 11th, Sunday night, uh, we have uh, the Calvary and Cook Choirs combined uh, for a Christmas program here uh, in our facility. Uh, we have a Christmas Eve service planned on the 24th at 5 p.m. And then we will have Christmas service on Christmas Day. We will have it at 10 a.m., one service at 10 a.m., on Christmas Day, and we invite you. I think it'd be a great uh, reflection uh, upon our God uh, for His people to be in church on Christmas Day, worshiping Him and celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we hope you will be here and consider perhaps inviting somebody to come with you as well. Any other announcements? There you go. Any other? Okay. Andrew, got any? Okay. God bless you all.